welcome to Friday night at the Refuge Center. What did I say a while back I was going to call it? The oven, a refuge oven or something? Um, I can't remember. But anyway, oven's a good word. It's a little warm. But you know what? I'll be warm for Jesus anytime. I'll sweat. I'll be hot. I'll be uncomfortable because, you know, he, he was real uncomfortable for me. And so I'm glad to have this place, and I'm glad just to be able to worship with all of you tonight. And praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever, the word tells us. And his grace is sufficient for all of our needs. Praise God for that. If you bow with me tonight as we ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, we come before you thanking you with gratitude in our hearts, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for all of our needs. According to your loving kindness, Lord, your faithfulness to us, God, it doesn't run out and it doesn't stop and it doesn't falter, Lord, when we falter. God, you are... 100% faithful, committed to each and every one of us, Lord. And you sealed that deal by sending Jesus to the cross. There's no taking that back. There's no changing that. Nothing anybody can do, God, can take that away from us. Nobody can snatch us out of your hands, Father. We know your word tells us that in the Gospel of John. So, Lord, we want to worship you with just gratitude, just Because of that tonight, Lord, we ask that you pour out your spirit upon us as we sing these praises to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame. I'll be Bye. 
have a seat if you'd like. I'm no longer a slave to fear. 
good to be with you guys tonight. I love singing worship and hearing all of your voices lifted to the Lord. It's a major blessing. I can never get tired of that. Um, it's just awesome to hear God's people praising Him. Even the off-key, I'm the one of the off-key guys. I don't care. I'm praising Jesus. Amen. Last week we wrapped up chapter 15. This week we're going to finish chapter 16. We will be done with the book of Romans. Hallelujah. Praise God for all of you that have stuck through the thick and the thin. And thank you for being always patient with me. I resign. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I, I'm glad Romans is an amazing book. And chapter 16 is awesome uh, before we finish the book tonight. But I'm excited, too, to move on to something else. So please pray for me that God would guide me to the next book that he wants us to go through because I want it to be from Jesus. I don't want it to be from me. I want it to be led by the Holy Spirit because he leads us into all truth and he knows what we need to hear. He knows tonight what we need to hear. He knows what I need to hear. Amen. I love that about God. That's something to be so grateful for. God knows what I need. And today's been kind of a, I don't know, hot day, I felt unproductive or whatever, and if you're anything like me, when I feel unproductive because I'm a man, I feel kind of useless, you know, and uh, and so I'm, I'm excited to get into God's Word. <laughs> Forget what happened today or didn't happen today. We get to open the Word of God tonight, and my heart's encouraged already just being here with you guys, so thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me complain. But anyways... Chapter 16 of Romans, man, so if you, if you just turn there, and I want to give you a little bit of a kind of a testimony of this book. Um, chapter 16 has some really weird names in it, and there's 28 of them, I believe, to be exact, and the majority of these people are women, and the majority of these people that Paul is thanking and, and giving God glory and praise for, uh, the, the, they're, they're women that served in the church, and and that could be a touchy issue for some people. And I just want to start off tonight by saying it's really not. Scripture is very clear about this. And, and this tonight is not a sermon about what women should and shouldn't do. The Bible is very clear on that. And I don't want to get that confused tonight. But I do want to mention, because it's in the text tonight, the first woman here, Phoebe, who we'll look at in the first two verses, um, they refer to the word refers to her as a servant. The same word we get from the, the word deacon, deaconess from, right? I'm not going to argue with scripture. If scripture calls her a deaconess, that's what scripture says. I do know that the, the word of God tells us that women shouldn't have authority over men from behind the pulpit teaching. That doesn't mean women can't teach women. Absolutely. That doesn't mean women can't serve in the church in all kinds of different areas. Absolutely. And what we're going to see tonight are some women who loved the Lord and served and, and had 
some pretty amazing uh, roles in ministry. Women are needed in the church. Man, let's just be real for a second. Imagine a church full of all men. I mean, God, the food would be horrible, right? The place would be ugly. It'd be probably black curtains everywhere, blacked out, right? We'd never mop the floor. We'd never clean the bathrooms. He probably wouldn't want to use the bathroom, right? But women, I like to look at it this way. My mom, who's went on to be with the Lord, her love and her heart was so radiant in all that she did. And my dad is too, just in a little different way, right? But women have this nurturing spirit about them, especially godly women, And Paul will also make mention of a woman tonight in the text that was like a mother to him. But I think of my own mom. Maybe you have a mother or a woman in your life, close family or friend that loved you like a mother would love you. And there's just nothing else like that in the world. I'll never forget when my little girl used to, uh, when she started talking, she'd say, Daddy, I love you. There's nothing else in this world that compares to that, right? Nothing else. Daddy, I love you. It's like, whoa, say that again. Let me record it. All right, it's so sweet. It's so innocent. Wade and I were talking today. He got to lead some people to the Lord and some younger little girls, actually a family, and he was just telling me how amazing and blessed it was that these little girls had their hands like this and they were praying and how precious it was, right? Women, we need you. This is not a message tonight about anything else except we're going to stick with the text. So let's pray. Let's ask God to to show us what he wants to speak. Father, we love you and we come before you tonight and just ask that that your spirit would speak clearly to us through the text. Lord, we don't take the text out of context. Father, we want to continue to walk and stay in the truth, Lord. So teach us tonight what it is we can glean from these verses in chapter 16, Lord. Thank you for the book of Romans, and God, just this place we can come together and and study the word and be fed and be lifted up and be encouraged, Lord. So we love you, God, and pray that you just be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, another thing I'll share with you, I'm going to butcher a lot of these names. Just go along with it, okay? If you want to look up the correct pronunciation, be my guest. I used to tell my children, my children, (laughs) The kids in the youth group years ago when I was a youth pastor, I said, look, if you're in the Old Testament and you're reading all these names, when you get to them, just like mumble something and just keep going. So it became quite the joke in the youth department. So we'd have like parent volunteers, you know, kind of sitting in and and these kids would be reading these names in the Old Testament. They'd be like, and the Lord said to blah, 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 blah. And all these parents (laughs) were looking at me like, what was that? So it was kind of funny, but. Anyways, chapter 16, let's look at the first 16 verses. I command, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Caesarea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself. I want to pause there uh, and just point out a few things. This is how we should treat the family of God. Paul's addressing those believers in in Rome at the time, and and he uses all these words, I commend you, right? I pray for you, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so. So So we see Paul's heart here for the church, the people of God, and that's one, one thing important we can take from all these names and these different things in chapter 16, is just right off the bat is how we see Paul greets these people. And he makes sure that all of them get greeted, that nobody gets left out. He calls them beloved and co-laborers, and he uses words of terms of endearment like that. And that should be how we are. That should be how we refer to each other in the body of Christ. You know, that should be how I look at my brothers and sisters. Just as Paul, man, he loved these people. He poured his life out for these people for the gospel's sake. And so we see that even in these, uh, even in the last chapter here. But Phoebe, right, as I shared earlier, uh, is a servant of the church, right? There's a bunch of house churches there. We're going to see a bunch of people that Paul greets, 
that were probably leaders or members or whatever you want to call them of these different house churches there in Rome. Verse 2, he says that, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. My question for us tonight, right off the bat, do we receive each other in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints? Really? Do we receive each other like this? This isn't these 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 words are they're they're loving. They're action words. Receiving somebody, you know, in the Lord. If I receive you in the Lord, then that means that that I that I don't look and, and I'm not judging you and I'm not, you know, uh, uh, scripture lashing you and I'm not putting myself above you and, and being prideful and arrogant and all those things, but I'm receiving you. You're God's child. You're God's son. You're God's daughter. Who am I to treat you any different but to receive you as, as the Lord receives me? To receive you to show that grace, to set myself and my little stinky wants and desires to the side and see what you have, well, how I can encourage and lift you up. You see, there's a lot of people in the church nowadays, and I used to be one of these people. You know, we can all tear each other down. That's easy. Let's just be real. We can all be negative and bitter and tear each other down. And, and that's so much easier sometimes. It feels like just to do that than to really deny myself. But as we see that what's modeled here for us through the Apostle Paul, I mean, he, this guy went the extra mile. He went the extra mile to love people for, for the gospel's sake because that's what God had called him to do. God calls us to do the same thing. Receive each other in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. And then he says, goes on there in verse 2, to, to assist her in whatever business she had. So obviously she was some type of businesswoman doing whatever. I'm not quite sure what kind of business she had, but Paul's saying, assist her, help her out. If she has need, help her out. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. In other words, she's aided and assisted him. And, and, and so he's saying, help her out, right? We were talking about in 1 Timothy chapter 5 last night, I think, in our group, talking about uh, widows and whatnot and how you know, the Bible is very clear that we're supposed to take care of the widows, and Wade was sharing about that, and I love that. Once again, just I mention that because we see the heart of our Father. Love, compassion, caring. Get out of the way of ourselves so that we can let God love and shine through us. Verse 3 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life. I love that. <laughs> to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. All right, so once again, we see two more people, Priscilla and Aquila. They were fellow workers uh, alongside of Paul. And it says there in verse 4, who risked their own necks for my life. So we see these, this love that Paul had for these people, but we also see in, in looking at the Scripture, some of the people how they returned that love. There was this mutual understanding about the brothers and sisters in the Lord and how they really had each other's back. I mean, the text says that literally um, <laughs> that they had uh, they, they, their own necks were on the line for Paul and for the gospel's sake. Likewise, it says in verse 5, greet the church that is in their house. So obviously they were leaders of a house church, maybe like a home fellowship Bible study that we might have nowadays, similar type of thing. He carries on there in verse 5, he says, Greet my beloved e something, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and, and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Verse 8, greet Amphib... something I can't pronounce. My beloved in the Lord, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, <laughs> my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, <laughs> who are in the Lord. 
Greet Tryphana and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, finally a name I can say, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Greet, uh, good luck, Astrinicus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobos, Hermes, and the brother who are with him. Greet Philogos and Julia, nurse, Nurses and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with him. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The church of Christ greets you. So it's really cool if you on your own would take this chapter and look up these verses and these names. Lots of these names have very important meaning. And it takes quite a bit of study time to do that. So I wanna I wanna move through this chapter so we could finish tonight, but there's a pretty extensive list going on of people here, and there's more in the in the verses to come. But one thing we can notice is that just the that the women in, in, in these verses and their roles, they were a big part of the gospel being spread and churches being planted back then, as they still are now. They had helped Paul, some of them, in, in many different ways, you know, and uh, some of them were like mothers to Paul, some of these women. Um, some of them worked very hard doing God's work. Paul mentions that many times. He mentions them as being fellow workers. Um, he mentions them as uh, fellow Christians. In Christ, in the Lord, approved by Christ, right? Um, he says all of these things about these people. And uh, once again, I, I, I think what's really stuck out to me this week as I study this text is, is how do I see God's people? You know, I mean, I can't even pronounce half of these names in the chapter tonight, but I do get what Paul is saying here. And I do see his love and compassion for the people there in Rome, the believers in the churches and the little uh, house groups that they had that he went around and planted on some of his missionary journeys. Um, let's see here. I lost my place. Wow, I just passed by three quarters of my notes. So... When you have time, or if you have time, I, uh, I, I encourage you, check out these names. Get some kind of study guide. If you have access to the Internet, you can get, you know, don't listen to what Google says all the time. But there's free resources that you can literally Google on your phone and commentary. And, and I always check uh, who I'm <laughs> looking at. But just make sure that these are people teaching the Bible, but there's, Lots of things to learn through all of these names. Maybe, you know what? Maybe we'll do a little study. Uh, next week, a brother of mine is teaching. But before we start a new book, I might do, because I, I have a, a, an outline put together from a while back with all these names and their meanings. And they're, it's really awesome. And their relationship with Paul and the church and things like that. So maybe we'll go through those before uh, we start the next book. Let's pick it up at verse 17. It says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. Once again, we see a very clear verse here, right? I urge you, pay attention to those people who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned. And he says there, avoid them. Strong language once again. There are those who don't have anything better to do than cause division in the church body. Now there's some that might be doing that and they don't know they're doing that or they're new in the faith or whatever, but there are still these people, I know a handful of people who are not new in their faith and, you know, it's like division follows them around where they go and you know, I, I could have been myself in that category at one point because of my behavior as a believer. But Paul is urging us and urging them, the Christians there in Rome, pay attention to those people and, and, and don't hang out with them. 
You know, we're not going to save every single person. Well, we don't save anybody. Jesus, the blood of Jesus does. But sometimes we just got to let it go, right? So Paul is saying, look, note those people, know who they are, and definitely don't engage in what they're doing because then you're kind of just spreading what they're doing, right? Pay attention to them. We can always pray for people no matter what. I don't have to be super involved in your life to be able to pray for you. Maybe it's something negative. Maybe maybe it's a person that's causing, you know, division. And it's like, well, okay, I'm going to pray for this person that, you know, that their heart would be humbled before the Lord. We can all do that without being directly involved in stuff. And check this out. Any church you go to anywhere, anytime, you will find divisions and dissension. Why? Because we're all human beings. We're still walking in the flesh. We're still going to trip up once in a while. Now, we we certainly try not to do those things. And the more we grow in our faith, the more we realize, well, I don't have to do those things. In fact, I can do the opposite of those things. And I can try to build this brother up and that brother up and this sister up. And I can pray for these people, you know, that might have their little click over here or over there or whatever it is. Paul carries on in verse 18. He says, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. I don't like that verse. Right? By smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. There's pastors out there right now. Let's just call it what it is that are living life luxury, you know, in billion-dollar homes and and their jets flying all over the place with their Armani suits. And come on, dude, right? We see that. There's people out there like that. And it's very clear. Beware of those people and stay away from them. It says, so they're not serving our Lord Jesus Christ. They're serving their own bellies. And they, by smooth words and flattering speech... How many televangelist false teachers have I heard? They, they, they got all these really cool words and all these really awesome like uh, illustrations about their little text. And boy, they got like a hundred different ways you can give to their multi billion dollar organization. You know, they got that down. They got QR codes like you ain't ever seen and, and prayer rugs they send you and spray bottles of holy water and all this kind of stuff. They got it down. And you watch it on TV, maybe if you're like me, and you're like, hmm, okay. Man, that guy's a good speaker. And some people are good speakers that love Jesus and that are serving Jesus and that are preaching the Bible, but some aren't. It's so important that we know the Word of God. Not every single page in the Bible, but we know the Word of God. in our. See, you don't have to have the whole Bible memorized. You don't have to be the best guy in the room at memorizing Scripture. You have to be submitted and yielded to Jesus Christ, and then He will reveal the truth of God's Word to you as needed in our lives. God doesn't call us to understand all of His Word. What He calls us to do is abide in the vine, to stay plugged into the power source. He will reveal these things to us, and He will teach us through His Holy Spirit the truth of God's Word and what this means and exactly the time we need it. So it's important for you and I tonight to be students of the Word of God so that we are not swayed by these flattery speech and these, you know, and, and, and these people, they, they deceive the hearts of the simple. They go after the simple. They go after the ones that are quickly going to get on board with them. A lot of times they steer away from maybe more sound believers or people that are more studied in the Word. Why? Because, well, you can pick them off real quick if you know the Word of God. You're like, wait a minute, uh, that, that doesn't line up with the Bible. Something wrong with that. I'll never forget this. This has happened years and years ago. Um, my, my, my daughter's uh, mom's side of the family, they have an a individual in their family who uh, is Mormon, and I, I was talking to this lady years and years ago 
I just asked her, I said, well, how how'd you become Mormon? You know, <laughs> I just don't mind asking those questions. And she says, um, well, you know, and, and by the way, her, her dad was a very uh, uh, godly man on top of it. So I was kind of curious, like, how did you, you know, get to be in the Mormon church? Nobody else in that family was. It was just her. And so long story short, basically is they reached out to her. They showed that they cared about her, and she was a lonely person and needed that, and that's all it took, and she was all on board, and I got to thinking, man, why don't I do that, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Why don't I just love people and reach out with the love of God? Because this 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 lady, you know, if, if a a Believer would have got to her first and extended that same love to her. She probably would have been in the family of God. She probably wouldn't have never went to that church. And so I've always thought about that. You know, God's love is that powerful. That's why we yield ourselves. That's why we step out of the way. You know, we pray, Jesus, your will be done. Then we let him do that and extend the grace and the love that's been shown to us, to others. God will take care of the internal stuff. That's his job. He does those miraculous things. We don't, we don't do that. We just, we're the conduit. We're the, the conduit to which the water is flowing through. The living water, right? Or the electricity if you're an electrician. Or not the electricity itself. That's God. His power is in his blood. What he's done for us on the cross. We just share that with people. So beware of the people that are doing things for their own selfish ambition and, and flattering speech and deceiving the hearts of the very simple. Verse 19 and 20 says, For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. I love that verse. Therefore, I am glad, he says, on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. If you take back and you look at the last 16 chapters of Romans, you get to see what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. He says, look, we've laid all of this groundwork, all the foundational, fundamental things of our faith have been laid out. Salvation and what it means and the sacrifice Jesus has made and what that is and how that applies. That stuff we've already talked about in the last 16 chapters. And he says, I'm glad for that on your behalf. Now you know, right? And he says, now that you know, I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. I love the words chosen there, uh, to be wise in what is good. We know what is good. Paul just got done telling us for the last 15 chapters about the goodness of God and what is good. Not to mention we have the rest of the Word of God where we can see attributes of God, we can see His characteristics, we can see things He says, put these things on. We see these lists that say, put these things off. So we know what things are good. And if that's not good enough, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us that when we get close to these things that aren't good, there's this thing called conviction. We should be paying attention to that. If my heart and my spirit is uneasy about something, it's not that I just ate tacos for lunch and I have indigestion. It's probably the Holy Spirit saying, Brian, slow down. Brian, don't go that way. Right? I need to pay attention to those things. I need to pay attention. I need to be wise, meaning learning, understanding what is good. And then he says, simple concerning evil. It doesn't get much more simple than this. Avoid evil at all costs. Keep it simple. People like to talk their way around about sin and, well, this and that. No, there is no talking our way around about sin. Sin is sin. Evil is evil. As believers of Jesus Christ tonight, we've been made into new creations and the Spirit of God resides in us. Therefore, those evil things we should not want to participate in. And if we do, we fall on our knees and say, Lord, I'm struggling. 
or we call a brother or a sister for an encouragement or prayer or whatever it is. We keep it simple. Keep it simple. Take everything and bounce it off the Word of God. I'm making a decision in my family, with my wife, with my daughter, with this, with that. Am I just on a whim, like, oh, yeah, okay, let's do this, this. Or am I saying, okay, what, 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 what would God say? Remember those little bracelets, what, WWJD or whatever? What would Jesus do? Hey, that's, that's a great question to ask ourselves constantly. God, what would you do? What does your word say about this, Lord? I have an opportunity we were talking about in our U-turn leadership meeting, a different U-turn ranch needed some kind of leadership, you know, and, and so Pastor Kevin mentioned that need to us. And so as I was thinking about that, um, you know, I, I, I sent a little message to our, our group and I said, blossom where God has you planted. In other words, if God has called us to be here where we're at at this time, we need to be faithful as we can be and blossom where God has us planted. We don't need to be overthinking things. We don't need to be making things not simple. You know who's the author of confusion? It's not God. 1 Corinthians 14.40 God is not a God of disorder. The enemy is. He likes to fumble stuff around. And remember, Paul was warning us to be, to be aware of those things, to be aware of the enemy, keep simple evil, keep it away, keep it out of our lives, do what is good. And then he says, check this out in verse 20, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. Soon and very soon, right? He's going to crush Satan's dome under our feet, my feet and your feet. That's coming. I can't wait to curb stomp the devil's head. Man, thank you, Jesus, for that. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Those are just awesome, those two pieces to that verse. At first, he gives us this phenomenal picture of what's going to happen with Satan's head. It's going to be crushed under our feet. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I love those kind of, they go together well. Verses 21. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sopater, my countrymen, greet you. I like how Paul, he, he talks about his countrymen, right? He talks about those, the Jewish people, showing that there's absolutely no, no difference anymore between his people, the Jews and the Gentiles. Remember, we've talked about that, that God has abolished that wall of separation, that we're all one family of God, a part of the same family. The Gentiles were grafted in, right? God has a plan from the very beginning to bring all people to him. That's what's going on right now in Israel, to bring all of those people that don't know Jesus or believe in Jesus as the Messiah to bring them in to the family of God. Paul's making mention, look, to you Jewish people, my, my countrymen, that's what he's referring to. Verse 22, I, Tetris, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. We talked about that in the beginning of Romans months ago, that Tetris is the one who actually penned this letter through Paul. Uh, and that's what he's mentioning there in verse 22, greeting him. In verse 23, Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Cortus, a brother. Verse 24 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I love how every four or five verses here, Paul just throws that in. The grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Right? I mean, we can really take those words and apply it to anything in our life. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with me. Amen. So be it. Let it be done. In Jesus' name. Verse 25, he says, Now to him who was able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world 
begin. Now to him who is able. Let's just pause there for a moment. Paul is saying, now to him. Remember, Paul would give God glory and remind those believers in Rome many times as we will be reminded tonight. It's all about God. It's about giving God glory. It isn't about you and me getting any glory or any accolades for anything. It's about Jesus. It's about God, right? It's about what God has done for us tonight. It was about what God was doing in the, in the church in Rome there when Paul uh, wrote this letter. It still is today. It's always going to be about him. That's why Paul says to him, now to him who is able. There's nobody else able to impart the gospel to us but God. There's nobody else. I mean, people can speak it to us, but it's the Holy Spirit that comes in, into us, that bears witness with our soul and says, hey, you've been born again. You've been made new. That can't happen through anybody else but God. Period. So now to him who is able, and I, it carries on to say to establish, to the word establish, a firm foundation under your feet. We're standing or sitting on this concrete tonight, right? There ain't no way this concrete's given out. If it does, there's some major issues going on that I'm scared of, okay? I know that this concrete is there. When Christ establishes us, it's the same thing. We're standing on the rock. We're not standing on a rock, right? There's a parable about that in the Gospels. I don't want to get off track. But we're standing on the rock. Petros, Petra, two different Greek words referring to rocks, right? I don't remember off the top of my head right now which one is referring to Christ. But that, that, that rock has a, the idea of these humongous boulders coming up from the ground that are supporting all these other little rocks all over the place. That's Jesus. That's the rock that we stand on. He's able to establish us according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, Paul says. He's establishing us in the gospel. He's establishing the believers there in Rome in the gospel through the preaching of Jesus Christ. It's not through any other god. It's not through any Greek god or goddess they may have been worshiping back then. No, it's through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. God has been revealing this since the very beginning. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you can see the gospel from the get-go. All the way through the Old Testament and on through to the New Testament until Jesus completed his death on the cross. It's not something that we can't find in the gospel, and it's being revealed to us. I like that word, reveal, revelation. Revelation comes from God. Revelation doesn't come from somebody else. So that means God reveals this thing to us only because God has to reveal it to I can't reveal the mysterious things of God to you. I'm just a person. I can't, I can't impart to you some kind of godly revelation from God. Only God can do that. Only the Spirit of God can do that within me. Verse 26, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scripture made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. Once again, Paul is just reiterating. We talked about Abraham and how um, Abraham believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness from the very beginning, right? The Old Testament, it plays right into the New Testament. There's prophecy, there's scriptures that are made known to all nations. There comes a time when there, nobody can say, I didn't know. There's coming a time when there's not anybody on the face of this earth that'll be able to say, I didn't know. That's pretty amazing. And that's how powerful God is. And that's how big our Father is. says there that the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to faith to God, verse 27, to God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. 
I would say to you tonight, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of other meat in this text tonight. I had a great time listening to Pastor Chuck Smith, my wife and I, on sermons on Romans chapter 16. Uh, Pastor Skip Isaac in Albuquerque, I listened to a couple of his teachings and I was like, dude, this is amazing, right? So it was a blessing to be able to go through all of these things tonight. Remember, women play an important role in the church. My mom played a super important role in my life. Your mom or mother figure, I'm sure, at some point, if you have that, it played a super important role in your life. We always need to gauge things against Scripture. Sometimes I think we have these personal opinions. Maybe we were raised this way or that way, and it can be easy to follow in the footsteps of a loved one just because as kids that's what we naturally do. But make sure it lines up with the Bible. I know that's a tough one. It's like, well, my mom and dad loved me, but they didn't know God. Well, that's okay. That doesn't mean their love was void. right? But that means you know God, you know the truth. So you take and you shine your light to your mom and dad. You pray for them. But you don't follow in those footsteps because you know better. See, once you know the truth, you can't go back. Once you know the truth, and it's been revealed to you, and Scripture says that it's been made manifest to all of us, even through God's creation. You look outside and you see creation. You're like, well, <laughs> there is a creator. There has to be. Believe me, I've studied Darwinism. I've studied all those things. They're lame. I've listened to some of the most studied people in apologetics and things throughout Bible college, and I've read the books, and I've heard the testimonies. One of my favorite authors is Josh McDowell. He was a hardcore atheist on his hot pursuit to prove that God did not exist. And at the very center of his many years of extensive studying, what he found was God did exist. And he wrote a book called The New Evidence. It's an old book, but it's a testimony of how he came to know Jesus. There's a lot of people out there that have committed their lives to proving there is no God, only to find that there is a God. And that God loves them. Imagine that, right? That same God loves you and I tonight. But have we reached out to him? Have we extended and, and said, Lord, Come into my heart. I need you. Reveal yourself to me, God. Have we done that? And if you have, if you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, if you're born again tonight, my challenge to you is to ask yourself this question, how do I treat people in the family of God? Do I receive them in the Lord like Paul instructed us to do? Or am I in the other camp over here causing bitterness because things aren't going my way? You know what I learned in life? The more I study and, and, and be around other believers, things aren't ever going to go right. We're all broken people. That's just it. I used to remember thinking in U-turn, come on, God, can you give us some overseers that'll like stay around? And like, what's the deal here? <laughs> the Lord gently reminded me of how many times I didn't stay around. Oh. Okay, God, I was not talking about me, right? How come we can't have like some on fire, like 10 of the most biggest world changer overseers in the U-turns ever seen in the history of the ministry? <laughs> not only, you know, is that foolish of me to think that, but God's like, I've given you who I've given you. And these people, when they turn their wills over to Jesus, they are the most powerful people in the world. This is who we have, right? Lord, can't you give me somebody to, that can lead worship at the church and help me out? God's like, dude, I've surrounded you with like 30 people. What more do you want? These are the people God has given us. The person sitting right next to you is your brother or sister in the Lord. You don't get to choose who sits next to you at Sunday morning church. If you come in and a, and a guest walks in from wherever and sits down next to you, that's the person that God brought in to sit next to you. What are you doing to them? Are you extending that grace? Are you receiving them in? Or are you going, oh man, they stink. Oh, they just did that. You know, we've all been there and done that. 
But Paul would address us differently. Show the love of Christ that's been shown to us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for this evening, Lord. I pray that Romans chapter 16 just would make sense to us through your spirit, Lord, through the word of truth, and help us to understand these things, God. Help us to be able to give us the desire to go back and study and look deeper into this, Lord, and that we may grow spiritually just with, just with you, us and you, Lord, that one-on-one time. Father, we meet corporately and we study your word together, but God, may we have that deep desire in our hearts to meet with you each and every day. All throughout the day, Lord, whatever it is we need, every five minutes, whatever, God, we need you. And Lord, you're readily there for us each and every time, and that's such a blessing, God. We thank you for that. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.